Hi, folks. This is Keith. This is Andy. Welcome to Brockton Bay. Welcome to another episode of the Brockton Bay Chronicles, reviewing Worm by Wildbow. This is the podcast where my co-host and longtime friend Andy and I discuss his first reading of Worm. Andy, what arc will we be covering today? We will be reviewing arc five, Hive. And we have some feedback from YouTube. Yeah, actually we do. We have a comment from YouTube subscriber Megafire7. Now this is regarding your selection for key character of the arc last episode. And Megafire has put forth who they thought might be the key character and why. Let's, uh, let's see what you think of this. So here's, uh, here's his comment. For me, the key character of the arc was Park ji Hu. He's the first on-screen death of the story, and this comes with a massive tonal shift. Lung was dangerous, but we didn't see him kill anyone, and Taylor's kind of played on easy mode since then. But just as she's starting to make some friends and thinks she can enjoy this life, Bakuda drops on their heads, and things quickly go to hell. Park's death felt like a pivotal moment in that regard. What do you think about that? That's a that's an interesting perspective. And I guess I hadn't contemplated the kind of the MVP, as I was calling it, when we were planning this out in quite that way. I think Megafire 7 definitely has a point here. That was a real shocking scene. And I don't remember if we commented on it, but I know when I read it, I was like, oh, my gosh, somebody died finally, you know, in a superhero type story. You expect it to happen somewhat regularly and it hadn't happened yet. So this definitely was a, a turning point, kind of a sea change, if you will. So I, I, I think it's a great point. And I'll try to keep that in mind going forward rather than being kind of the the thing that turned the tide in the favor of the the main character or her side of the deal, looking at it more, what what might have been the overall outstanding moment in the chapter, if you will. That's fair. Yeah. Again, when we, you and I were discussing this ahead of time, we were looking for something that that would be unique and interesting and and we certainly are glad to have um, this kind of engagement from from Megafire, and we certainly encourage other folks to, you know, in the comments, certainly put out um, who you thought might be the key character. Perhaps we can get some interesting debates going in the comment section. That sounds like a great idea. All right, and I guess that's all we have for new business, as it were, so we can get going to our point by point. Sound like a plan? I think it's time to kick the tires, light the fires. Sounds good to me. All right, so arc five, chapter one. In this arc, we have a gathering of all the major villains in Brockton Bay. It seems that the ABB under Bakuda and uh, and Lung's leadership have gone on a bit of a tear, and their actions are garnering a lot of attention from the authorities, not just local authorities, but national authorities as well. So the, all the villains, the major players in, in the Brockton Bay area have, got, have gathered on neutral ground and decided to uh, come up with a, a plan for how to deal with these guys. Yeah, I think it reminded me a little bit of the scene from the third Matrix movie where they're talking about the different objectives that they have and they're trying to plan out and Morpheus says, I see three captains and I see three objectives. And so it was interesting to see how they were kind of uh, focusing on a common enemy here and realizing that they needed to uh, shut down ABP any way that they could, even by kind of putting aside their differences. Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the primary participants, I guess this was the gentleman who actually put it together and put this meeting together and we've heard his name mentioned before, Coyle. Coyle, um, as he as everyone settles down in their in their seats at the at this location that they're meeting at, Coyle reads off kind of a bill of particulars against the ABB. 
he stated the uh, ramifications of some of their actions. 35 individuals confirmed dead and over 100 hospitalized in the past week. Armed presence on the streets, ongoing exchanges of gunfire between the ABB members and combined forces of the police and military. They have raided our businesses and bombed our and bombed places where they think we might be operating. So the ABB have gone on the offensive, trying to make their big play for the for the city of Brockton Bay. It's kind of like once Bakuda was kind of let off the leash, she's just gone full nuclear option and is just causing chaos, not caring who who dies, who lives, and it's precipitated this group forming and and trying to put a stop to it. Let's have a discussion about the individuals, uh, the different teams that arrived at this meeting. Um, Did anybody in particular catch your attention or any of the groups you want to comment on? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the, the Empire folks are there. They're obviously very powerful, but people definitely recognize that they're very far to one side of the uh, spectrum and they're kind of willing to let them be there to fight this common foe, even that there are so many, uh, there's so much antagonism toward them and they have so much antagonism toward other groups. The, f- the way they interact with that first group and make them not sit at the table because they're kind of second tier or you know, they're all drug users and they, they push drugs. That's an interesting power play. I like the travelers a lot. I, I thought that was very interesting, the way that they move around a lot and kind of just chime in wherever they, they want to. They stood out to me, I think, the most, other than the, you know, Empire 88 and the fact that people are willing to kind of overlook things with them to band together against the common foe. We got a couple of uh, interesting uh, sounding individuals on Fault Lines crew, Gregor the Snail and Neuter. Any thoughts about those two? You know, they're definitely outside the norm. They're kind of the first ones that can't pass for just non-parahumans. Gregor's is a huge guy with, you know, kind of see-through body and these weird swirl patterns and little scales, if you will. And then neuters this, you know, kind of orange version of Nightcrawler with, uh, with the tail. And, and so it's a really intriguing group and you wonder, it made me wonder how many more out there might be, you know, very, very different on the outside, as well as having these powers. Yeah, this is the first time we get a look at people who are, like you said, outside the norm physically. We didn't get a display of powers, uh, being that this was on neutral ground. That was one of the one of the things was, hey, we're going to sit here. We're going to meet, but uh, no use of powers here. We'll definitely keep an eye out on those two guys. So uh, everyone, uh, all the leaders of their team sit around a uh, common table, the, their subordinates, if you will, or sitting off to the side. And the villain groups agree to a truce for the duration of their assaults against the the ABB, they're going to set aside their enmity that they may have for each other in order to tamp down these guys who are really bringing uh, bringing law enforcement down on all of them. And and they're indiscriminately trying to take out these other villain groups too. So they're attacking their places of business or where they think they might be operating, as you said, in the text. And so it's it's not only that their yeah their city is is under heightened scrutiny now by the uh, protectorate and law enforcement, but they're also, you know, fighting for their own survival against this rash of attacks from ABB as ABB seems to be trying to take over all the crime in the city. I do like this uh, this one section where we get another look at Tattletail's power. I like this exchange between her and Skitter. And Tattletail begins with Tattletail saying, funny, Tattletail murmured. I turned away from the scene to look at her. What? Aside from Gru and maybe Faultline, 
everyone's already plotting how they can use this situation to their advantage. So she's already seeing that other pe people are already planning, hey, once this is over with, what can I do to, to improve my position? Well, and I think that shows a very, if not a clear difference between the undersiders and the rest of the folks, then at least uh, something we've kind of come to subconsciously understand. And that is that they aren't your kind of career criminal folks. Typically, as we see portrayed in the media, the criminal mind is always about trying to get an angle, trying to get a leg up, trying to find a way to exert leverage. And so it's somewhat unsurprising that all these groups are doing it. What to me was surprising was that Fault Lines group was not thinking that. And so, you know, there, there may be a, a case down the road where, you know, Fault Lines group could partner up kind of or form a somewhat of an alliance with the undersiders. They seem to be more philosophically aligned than the other folks that are all just out to get theirs. Fair point. Let's uh, let's see how that goes. So as the meeting is heading towards the end, as they're uh, they establish the truce and and come to agreement that they'll set aside their their own uh, problems with each other, Coyle addresses the room and asks if anybody has any other issues, announcements, or grievances. Grievances, and one of Kaiser's underlings uh, speaks up, a guy named Hook Hook Wolf, and it turns out that the dog fighting ring that bitch broke up in the previous arc was under his control. It was his business. And he wasn't happy with her at all and was making it be known. Gru was kind of blindsided by this. We're moving into chapter two here. Gru was blindsided by this, but he handled the situation pretty well. This was a very interesting exchange, I thought. And I like the way Wild Bo tied it into that interlude a ways back where we understood now kind of the consequences or the ramifications uh, besides what already happened that the other things that had happened because of the breaking up the dog fighting ring. But it's my assumption when I read that interlude was that it was just some regular dog fighting ring, not necessarily a big criminal enterprise or anything, but now that it's brought forth this way, it totally makes sense that the capes or the villains would the parahuman villains would be running all the crime or the vast majority of it. And so bitch had obviously stepped on some, some serious toes and uh, upset some people. And then, yeah, Gru didn't even know about it. And so that upset him as well. I thought that it was almost like Coyle had some, had some experience mediating these kind of situations before where it was, you know, he had maybe learned the hard way that if you did try to get everything on the table at the beginning, that stuff could get sideways in an operation and that would be bad for everybody. But yeah, Gru is, is not happy about what uh, what Bitch did, but he does handle it really well with the with the people at the table and he handles it a whole different way down the street. Very much so. Yeah, he was extremely skillful. In, in that situation and kind of jujitsu his way into putting putting Kaiser in kind of an awkward spot and enough of an awkward spot to where Gru was able to get out from underneath the the being blindsided by this situation. Tattletail, let's talk about Coil just a, a a bit. Tattletail said that he's kind of a chess master. She wasn't even sure if he had powers or what they would be. He has kind of an army. And I think was it Two arcs ago, might have been when um, when Glory Girl was interrogating that Empire 88 skinhead, he mentioned Coil as being one of the players who would be trying to gain territory in what they thought would be the vacuum left by by the ABB. Right. Yeah, I had, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, this kind of plays into it plays into that. So, uh, any thoughts on Coil? We're not getting a lot of information, but. We don't know if he's powered, but he's he's got an army of mercs. Right. The powers are unknown at this point, but he definitely seems to be well-versed in, in strategy and tactics. And he seems to be a good evaluator of uh, mercenaries, as we find out more later. 
And from what we're told now, he he picks good people and equips them really well. So, so whether it's money or 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 powers, he's he he does have skill. Exactly. Yeah, he's he's a he's a major player, but not near as in your face as some of the other folks. Right. So the meeting breaks up. Gru manages to talk the situ talk Kaiser into saying, "Hey, why don't we shelve this disagreement until after we deal with the ABB?" The meeting breaks up. The undersiders head down the street, and Gru is not. He lets his frustration and anger vent against bitch. Yeah, this is uh, an intense scene. It really is. It really is. Yeah, and I could totally relate to Gru's frustration. It seems like the the stereotype of a criminal organization is that the leader is some kind of super violent person that, you know, dominates and, and uses fear to keep people in line. And, and Gru is not interested in that at all. He sees this much as a team. He wants people to be on the same page. They, they debate things. They, they work through things. And then you have bitch and she's just kind of off in her own world and, you know, does her own thing. Doesn't seem to get the whole team concept very much unless they're in the middle of a storm and she's got to react and, and she's able to just focus on who should, who should be bitten or, you know, who should I attack? Yeah, that's, that's a good way to look at it. And even, uh, even Tattletail cuts in. Gru was going to a point where he was about to say, well, he did say, do I need to talk to the boss and see if we can replace you? And Tattletail stepped in there. She tried to, she tried another tack, basically tried to talk her way, talk a little easier, conveying her, her anger, but still talked a little easier to bitch and said, Hey, look, all you had to do was communicate. If you'd have let us know that you were thinking about cutting out early to go get the money, we could have possibly seen the the ambush here. If you'd have told us that you'd have broken up the that you broke up the dog fighting ring belonging to to Hook Wolf, we could have grew could have anticipated being confronted here tonight. It's all about communication. Bitch seems to get it, but I'm not sure. You just don't know with her. It's it's really hard to read her reactions. Communication, though, is a common problem in almost every environment, you know, family relations, work, school. You know, I can think back to needing to turn in a a project late or something in school and have the teacher told me, well, if you just told me a week ago that you didn't think you were going to make it, then I could have, you know, given you some leeway, but you're coming to me at the last minute. So yeah, that, that kind of things happen to us all. I'm sure from time to time. Yeah. But this seems like it's pretty obvious. That she yeah. should have said something. This is not like, Oh yeah, sorry. I had to stop and get some coffee. I was tired. That's why I'm 15 minutes late kind of thing. So there's definitely something going on with her and, you know, my thinking is that, I don't know, maybe it's her, her how she came up and, and all the struggles she went through, but she just seems to really just do her own thing and, and figures everybody's going to be mad at her all the time anyway. So what does it matter if they know ahead of time or not? After getting a, a tongue lashing from Gru and Tattletail, the group continues to uh, head on back to, to the lair. Skitter decides to try to interact and not necessarily commiserate but uh interact with with bitch and get a little more information she queries queries bitch says hook wolf was running a dog fighting ring i asked her in a lowered voice like making dogs fight fight to the death bitch answered almost inaudible and you stop them and she turned her head and met my eyes made them bleed i felt goosebumps prickle at the back of my neck and arms I wasn't sure if I would feel better or worse if she decided to elaborate. Good, I replied. So Skitter is trying to uh, trying to interact with bitch with you know in a, the most diplomatic way she saw fit or saw possible. Exactly, I think there's a certain amount of compassion here. I mean, it must have been really shocking to her. I can remember when dogfighting has been in the news in the past and how 
disgusted I was to even hear that that was going on. You think of it as being something that was, you know, kind of middle ages or something that it's, yeah, it's not something that happens anymore. And so I can imagine her reaction as this is just another one of those things where it's like, maybe it's out there, maybe it's not, but now it's right in my face. And so yes, bitch could have handled it a hundred percent better with the team and kept people in the loop, but she did, you know, write a, a disgusting wrong that was going on. And so I think Skidder's just trying to connect with her on that level, saying that putting all the other stuff aside, what you did was a good thing. Yeah. I do want to, before we move too far ahead, I wanted to ask you something about, about Skidmark and his, his two flunkies. Now, so far in this story, everybody seems to have a layer of depth to them. Um, there's complexity to even to Kaiser, disgusting as his beliefs are. There, he, he's not a he's not a comic book villain. What about Skidmark? Is do you get the feeling? I thought this might be the first two dimensional character. Yeah, am I overthinking that? That's a good point. I didn't I didn't really think of it that way, and it's it's probably my bias regarding people in that line of work or in that lifestyle, I kind of think of them as two dimensional, I guess, either they're high or they're not high. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a legitimate point, but I think this is probably something that all authors struggle with. And that is that if you, if you provide every character with depth, then you end up with a book that's, you know, a thousand pages long and you may not get to the end of the story that you wanted to. Everybody's got a story, but that doesn't mean necessarily the author has the typing in their fingers to be able to put it all on paper, so to speak, or put it all on the web. So, yeah, when you when you put it that way, with the depth that everybody else has, then if this is the first character where I'm asking that question, then maybe I'm just being a little uh, a little too in the weeds on that. So yeah, I, I get your point. Definitely. Well, I, I think it's legitimate, but like Marvel universe, right? There's, there's all the, the superheroes and you, you kind of know their backstories and stuff, but then you get, you get them all up on the, the flying platform. I don't remember the name of it. And there's all these agents of shield and they're all just running around. You don't know any of them except the one guy that was trying to connect with people. And then the, the woman who's kind of flying the ship for uh, Nick Fury. Right. Um, but there's, there's gotta be thousands of people on there and they're, you know, they're just background, right. They're just kind of wandering the halls. So what did the, what did Marvel do? They spun off a whole new thing. <laughs> Agents of Shield, and, it's, <laughs> and then you get to hear more about them. So you got to kind of, I guess, pick your, your storylines and, you know, it's, it's, it's like when you're, you're at the Thanksgiving feast, right? You can't fit, you know, 16 ounces of every dish on your plate. As <laughs> so, much as I may want to try. Exactly. <laughs> so you go for the turkey, you go for your favorite sides, and then oh, I'll take a little bit of that, a little bit of this, uh, just for some flavor. Sure, sure. Moving on to, uh, moving on to chapter three, we find Taylor and Danny out shopping she's uh toward the end of her recovery from her her concussion and danny trying to help buoy her spirits a little bit decides to take her out to uh to, out to the mall to get some some new supplies for school the town brockton bay has a curfew in and the heroes have been because of the activities of the abb and the heroes uh from the protectorate and new wave have been pressed into service to kind of stand as, as guards at uh, various locations where, where civilians have gathered. So the situation is being dealt with by the protectorate in the best way they thought possible. This was uh, kind of a strange scene for me in that if I was a dad, I don't know that I would have taken my daughter who just got, hit by a bomb out into what seems like a war zone even if she did need stuff i think uh that might have been a big amazon shopping spree for me <laughs> maybe me and me and the kid would sit down in front of the computer and 
we'll we'll just shop online and let the the driver have to deal with the bombs in the street. But yeah, I, it seemed I don't know. It's interesting. You think I I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, yeah, that's a good point. You think that that's not a hole in the story? Uh, do you think? I mean, we we're we're deep in our praise for this story, so we've got to be honest, brokers, when we see something that we think might be askew. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm definitely turning into a fanboy. So <laughs> my take was more that this is evidence of a, a single parent, in this case, a father, not having that balancing opinion of a, a wife or a spouse I I to gotcha. try to keep him from, you know, doing something that's a little tone deaf. You know, I'm sure you've run into it. I know I've run into it where it's like, oh, hey, yeah, I was going to take the kid to go do this. And and my wife saying, what were you thinking? And, <laughs> and, and vice versa. Sure. You know, I just, you know, my wife saying, oh, here's a picture of me doing this with with our son. I was like, why were you doing that? That's, <laughs> that's not a great idea. I gotcha. Good. So point. that's how I, that's how I took it, but it was jarring for me. I, I would not have taken my concussed kid out into the streets of Iraq, if you will, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no. You put it that way. You're, you're definitely not alone in that thinking. So as um, Danny and Taylor finish up their shopping, they're deciding to, to head on home they have the misfortune of running into Emma and her father, Alan, I believe his name is. And they stand there and have a, you know, the, the two dads have no idea what's going on between their daughters. They have a, a genial conversation right up to the time that <laughs> Taylor pops her upside the head. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure what happened there when, when he said my hand was stinging. I thought, did she lose control of the bugs? Are they climbing on her hand? Is, is she so upset? And then, oh, okay. That was one of those just, yeah, the, the red film came down over the eyes. And just before you knew it, the, the punch has been thrown. So I was cheering for Taylor at that point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd wanted to pop Emma for a long time. So, oh, my gosh. You know, bullies are just the worst. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things I've just, I've, you know, maybe it's from getting razzed as a kid and then, you know, trying to, to help other people who are, who are in a similar situation and, and, you know, try to guide them through that terrible part of young adulthood. But this was, this was uh, a very unfortunate meeting <laughs> and or a stressful situation already. So but it, it leads it leads into some great stuff going forward. So uh, it was a neat turn in the story. Yeah. So immediately upon uh, seeing this happen, one of the the heroes who had been on on guard duty, uh, Shadow Stalker, is a teenage heroine. Um, she comes and manhandles Taylor, and and poor Danny is standing there, shocked at what just transpired, so apologizing to. Emma and her dad is, is begging the uh, the heroine shadow stalker to, to please understand, hey, my daughter is getting over a concussion. Here we have this scene where Taylor is not at all happy about the, the idea of this teenage heroine who she doesn't really seem to have much respect for chewing out her dad. She wasn't happy about that image at all. No, and this has a lot of the, the typical interaction with it, you know, it, in sports, they always say it's it's not the first person that commits the foul that gets caught. It's the second one. Right. And, you know, as a coach, you I'm sure you've told your players, don't retaliate. Oh, yes. You're going to be the one that gets the flag. Not that Emma did anything other than smirking or, you know, being her usual um, annoying Emma self. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, Taylor's definitely the one that gets busted for it. And, you know, with the tension on the streets, you can kind of understand the overabundance of use of force or caution from the protectorate member, but it's still, you don't like to see that, but you know, when, when there's figuratively bombs blowing up on every street corner, people are going to be, you know, on a hair trigger and, and they're going to want to make sure nothing gets sideways while they're on, on their watch. And so yeah, the, the cape definitely overreacts and totally understand 
Taylor being upset with the way her dad's treated and the way she's treated, but it's, it's somewhat human nature. So I get that. You want to comment on shadow stalkers power. We get a quick look of it. Look at it where she kind of walks through a, a door. Uh, Taylor had commented on how she thought it was an, an unnecessary display of power, but she has this ability to turn herself into a smoky state and pass through solid, solid objects. Yeah. I thought that was, that was cool from the author in a couple of ways. One is just to get to see the powers at work in action, but also a typical response of a group of people who are trying to control a large crowd or keep a large crowd in control is that they have to have that shock and awe a little bit. And so by Shadowstalker showing what she can do, now that anybody who's thinking they could run around the corner and hide, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. You know, they could they, they could go lock a door, they could do whatever, and Shadow Stalker is going to be able to get in and, and get them. So I think it's a it's it's kind of a crowd control device, if you will. And uh, I think it's effective in that way. So Shadow Stalker allows Danny to uh, she puts plastic cuffs on Taylor, which is kind of a humiliating deal. She allows Danny to take Taylor home. And here we have another one of these just incredible character interactions between between Danny and Taylor as they're driving home, where she comes clean to him about Emma and her role as being one of her tormentors. I agree with you 100 percent there. It was one of those things where the tension was kind of building and, and you knew it was going to have to come to a head somehow. Uh, it was an interesting vehicle, the kind of happenstance uh, bumping into Emma and her dad, and then uh, the fallout from that, that precipitated it, the, the scene in the car. But it's it's great that that's finally resolved. It's not hanging out there anymore, at least in, as a huge elephant, elephant in the room. There's still parts of it that are to be resolved, but at least some of the cards are on the table now and, and Danny can, if not breathe a sigh of relief, at least have something to try to help with and to have an objective, if you will, of, of, of way of going forward rather than knowing that his, his daughter is suffering and not knowing what to do. Uh, this section and then in, in the chapter uh, that we're about to go into, whereas I, as before, I questioned Skidmark being a two-dimensional character here we see Danny being such a good father the, again I think I said in, in our first episode this guy loves his kid definitely and you know as we've talked about before so challenging as a single parent to start with and then having lost your spouse in such a, a terrible manner it's it i can't imagine what it must be like for him as a parent uh but he's really doing the best that he can walking that fine line between being the intrusive parent of a teenager and the total hands off parent and to top it all off you know the the terrible situation Taylor's been in at school he's wild bo's done a great job of portraying that with Danny and and i think he's doing a great job and I want to make sure I give credit to Taylor. She didn't have to open up to him. That did take some courage for her to finally. And I think I, I breathed a sigh of relief when she finally told him, yes, Emma is one of the people who's been, who's been harassing me at school. I was so happy when she shared, she had the courage to share that with him. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was talking about with the tension building. You knew there had to be some way for this to resolve or it was just going to get to where they weren't talking to each other or Taylor was spending all the time at the undersiders hideout or whatever. And, you know, possible major breakage in the relationship with her dad. And so that's typically what happens in our lives though, is that some event precipitates us finally kind of getting off the dime, if you will. And, you know, doing what we know we need to do, coming clean on stuff. So it was good to see. So moving into chapter four, 
there is a big meeting at the school. It's uh, Taylor and Danny and Emma Madison, Sophia and their guardians, as well as the principal and most of Taylor's, or I believe all of Taylor's teachers, they have a, a meeting to discuss this harassment and bullying that she's been undergoing. I went into this hoping, <laughs> naively, I guess, I went into this hoping it would go go well for for Taylor, and it doesn't. It, Emma's dad is, I don't like that guy at all. <laughs> well, you know, all the, the jokes they say about lawyers. So. Yeah. He, he definitely kind of personifies that uh, personality or the reason for those jokes. This is the, the term that came to mind for me was kangaroo court. And usually it means something where someone's got, got trumped up charges and they're being railroaded. And so it wasn't quite that, but this was one where uh, it was totally legitimate. Taylor even had some ideas on how it could be resolved. and. You know, you would think there'd be some logic, but, you know, the typical admin red tape and pseudo legality and just the inertia and the lack of resources in the educational system, all that conspires against anything Taylor wants to do, anything Taylor wants to get across. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to stop talking about it there. Or I could just go on a rant <laughs> for another hour and a half. It was, this was a very... I was like, I was with you. I could see Taylor going to the other school and her maybe having to try to avoid getting detected by the wards that went to school there and trying to get info on them or whatever. I, I could see it going in lots of cool ways. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, nope. <laughs> so end of rant. <laughs> no, no problem at all. And then we see your buddy, your good old buddy, Mr. Gladly, just just being a punk in this situation, if, you'll, oh. if you don't mind me using that word. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, I think that's a great word for him. Yeah, he just was just like a folding chair. He just collapsed. He was worthless. So, but they, you know, almost everybody was worthless. Yeah. I mean, Taylor had like a ream of paper of all the emails. Oh, yes. She had everything documented and it didn't count for anything. Sorry, I said I was going to stop writing and I kept writing. That's all right, man. That's all right. <laughs> so one thing that was transpiring as Taylor got more and more emotional as things continued to go against her and her dad, she began really having to fight against her her powers. Um, she, there was a couple of times where she had mentioned that it felt like the, the bugs were trying to press in and and come into the room, come into the school and she had to, to, to force them away. So her power was working against her, her conscious will several times, and almost like it was responding to her emotions of being in this situation, being frustrated, being angry. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but that's a great point. And looking at it in the perspective that you just laid out, I can totally see that. You get to the point where you just feel like you're beating a head, your head against the wall and you're, you're just tracking your brain, trying to figure out how to get through to some folks. And no matter how artfully you craft, no matter how much evidence you have, nothing's getting through. I can imagine that, yeah, if there was, there were powers involved, you know, in, in a normal non parahuman you're clenching your fists you might be grinding your teeth bouncing your leg under the table whatever but for taylor you know there are other options she has <laughs> and parts of her brain are trying to help her resolve the situation with almost beyond her control yeah she has to kind of fight back against that so taylor angrily bolts out of the, the meeting room her dad corrals her and tries to talk her down and her response to this no justice for Taylor situation is to immediately try to go and hang out with a bunch of supervillains. <laughs> Instead of going home with her father and venting her frustration at home, Taylor makes a judgment call. I'm going to go hang out with bad guys. I hadn't thought of it that way. I thought of it more of I'll go hang with my friends that I'm able to vent to who maybe know more of the situation, but 
I can see where you're coming from on that. And I could see where if, if something hadn't intervened, it might've been kind of, you know what you guys were talking about getting some revenge. I think I'm ready to take you up on that. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So yeah, you would think that after the, the kind of the moment she'd had with her dad in the car that maybe they'd go try to work something out and they talk it out, but instead she just bolts, but that's, that's teenagers for you. You know, I mean, I, I read somewhere that uh, the reason teenagers make so many suboptimal choices <laughs> is that, you know, their brains are still kind of paring down, pruning the decision trees. They're, they're not aware yet which ones are more beneficial decisions than others or choices. And it's only as we get older that we're able to kind of say, oh, no, yeah, I remembered that one time that I made that bad call. Exactly. And instead, I'm going to take it a little easy this time. So she's just still finding her way and, and uh, you know, super frustrating situation, frustrating situation that she was struggling to control things. So fight or flight and fight was not an option. So she's she's fleeing the scene. And we move on to uh, to chapter five. Coyle had come up with a an idea for how to deal with the ABB. Taylor had called Lisa and and they t- she filled her in briefly on to as to what was going on and asked her if she wanted in. She said, absolutely. I need to hit somebody. Heads over to to the lair for the undersiders. And it turns out that Coyle's recommendation was to mix and match various group members together so that no one can um, hold anybody else's team member hostage or pull a fast one on, any, on anybody like that. Um, which seemed like a good idea. So you have a bit of fault lines crew, a bit of a couple of undersiders, some of it, uh, some of the empire people, and they decide that they're going to go hit three different locations around town on a simultaneous uh, simultaneous attack on ABB assets. Sounds like a good plan. I thought it was excellent. Yeah. I, again, I'm pointing out kind of what Tattletail had said that he's a bit of a chess master. Uh, mixing the crew is, crews is a is a calculated risk. Uh, you've got folks that don't know each other's powers. You don't know exactly what's going to happen or how they're going to work together, but you are mitigating the possibility of one person being overpowered by a a crew from another group uh, and something going sideways. And so, before they leave leave the lair, um, Lisa uh, tells tells Taylor about their code that they have for uh, making sure that each other is in good condition there. They have their cell phones and every 15 minutes or so they'll be calling each other and, and giving this signal as to whether they're in trouble or if they're okay or whatnot. I mentioned the group that um, a skitter got sent with, she was sent with uh, bitch Kaiser and a couple of his people, Sundancer, a couple of snipers from coils team neuter and labyrinth and that takes us on into basically chapters six seven and eight are the assaults on one of the abb locations you want to give an overall thought of that uh we don't necessarily have to dive into the specifics of the battle unless you want to i was thinking of you know giving a uh thirty thousand foot view uh more or less as we look at skitters and her ability as a, a battlefield commander or if you want to look at it that way that sounds good. You know, I, I I just did want to point out, you know, Kaiser again is trying to assert control of everything. And, you know, there's the usual kind of pissing contest with him where it's, you know, he's going to do his thing and, and, you know, pretend that nobody else has valid input. So it's kind of nice actually that he goes to the other side of the building. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to like deal with him for a while. I've never gotten along really well with folks who feel like they're the the smartest person in the room and everybody else is an idiot so i did like the scene where where bitch has uh, one of her dogs grow a couple of a uh, couple of feet in size and as they grew as he grew um shaking off the new the old flesh and it startled everybody there except for uh, skitter and in labyrinth and uh you know point made kaiser you're you, 
you think you're the man, but <laughs> no, you can you can still be brought down a peg. I forgot about that. Yeah, he got all, uh, hey, don't get that on my Armani kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> and it was like, wait a minute, I thought you were this badass, you know, just yeah. just take it. Come on. It's a little bit of, yeah, blood and guts. Tough it out. That was uh, I, that was a good scene. Uh, so like you said, Kaiser and his, his two people he has with him, uh, the twins, uh, Finya and Minya, they go to the opposite side of the building. Skitter and the in the remaining group take a few moments to uh, establish how they're going to assault their side of the building, and here we get uh, this is what I mean with regards to Skitter as a as a battlefield commander. She using her power, using her bugs. Again, the first time we see her make clones and set off some of the uh, the traps that Bakuda had in the building. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. She learned a lot from uh, Gru in that earlier encounter with uh, Bakuda, and uh, she's able to utilize a similar technique. She seems to be getting a better handle on how best to use the bugs and and what they're what they're good for. So that's uh, that's pretty neat. One thing I did want to touch on quick though was on the drive over. She mentions that she seems to have. Oh, right. more control and maybe bigger range. She's able to to summon them from further away or or something, and so that's interesting. It's almost like uh, as she's exercising her powers, they're they're improving or they're strengthening in some way. All right. Well, make sure you put a pin in that. Okay. Yeah. She also this time she decided to take some of the more the stinging and biting insects and put them in reserve on her person in her hair, in some of the, the open spaces in her armor and in other places, I think on her belt. So again, instead of being caught shorthanded or unarmed, she kept uh, a few in reserve, some of the more uh, dangerous bugs. Again, learning from past experience, uh, you know, great adjustment. So I, I thought that was really well done as well. And I think battlefield commander is a great way to put it. She, She's definitely thinking a couple moves ahead and planning and and trying to uh, adjust on the fly as best she can. Two characters I want to definitely touch on, Oni Lee and Neuter. So once we get into the battle, we, yeah, we find out what Neuter can do. And he tells told Skitter that all his bodily secretions pack a potent hallucinogenic. That was a, a very interesting power, I thought, and it's hard to think how effective that's going to be. It's not like other people are going to come lick him or something, so you're not sure how that's going to work, but it it was great in the battle uh, while he was doing okay, but Oni Lee's power kind of trumped his, and it took, again, some, some more fast thinking from Skitter to be able to counteract Oni Lee and his shifting and jumping around he is one bad dude he's effectively a ninja who can teleport and i think it was skitter who said when he teleports he leaves a a a copy of himself briefly there and can who can conduct one or two more moves before that copy then evaporates into carbon ash and sometimes he uses them as suicide bombers so only lee was attacking from one location and then disappearing and moving you know teleporting to another location leaving the clone there momentarily to act um that was a pretty scary fight until until skitter using her powers found a uh, clever way to to thwart him that was pretty cool you know the fact that the bug stayed with the real oni lee and didn't stick to the clone so to speak and so she's able to She's got fine enough control now and being able to detect the thoughts of these bugs and, and, and then see where they rematerialize with Oni Lee and being able to direct uh, the other members of the crew and the dogs to attack the correct one and, and, not, and avoid the clone. Oni Lee made a, a pretty good a- attempt at taking out Bitch. Fortunately, uh, Coil's snipers put a bullet in his head. Um, then he teleports to the top of a building, sees where the snipers are, teleports over there, takes those guys out. And he was just dangerous. 
yeah, that he's he's a master at using that power for sure. And I I think it's only the fact that he wasn't he had never run into something like the bugs being able to stick to him that uh, gave them a, a chance in that fight. Only Lee could have taken him out by himself. And it turns out not only is only Lee there, Lung is there too. And Kaiser has engineered himself a confrontation with Lung. Again, trying to show that he's the man. Right. Always, yeah. Kaiser's just going to go up against the biggest guy in the room and and prove that he's bigger. So I think I would have reacted a lot more vehemently in the opposite direction when I heard Lung was around than Skitter did. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have said, all right, I'm going to go hang back in the van. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a bug or two flying around and I'll, I'll get you on the radio but I don't want him to know I'm here because she knows she's got a price on her head with that guy. So, and she's seen firsthand what he can do. And, you know, we know from what's known about his powers that he just keeps getting stronger. So yeah, it seems like it's a kind of a no win situation and he knows the trick that she used the first time. So he's not going to let that happen. So once lung came on the scene, I thought, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if the protector was going to show up and have to do something or what. I, I didn't think these folks had a chance. Yeah, I thought the retreat was was going to have to happen. But um, no, her concern, one of her concerns, actually, it, it turned out that Neuter had gotten stabbed by Oni Lee and he was down and she was making a play to go and rescue him. Bitch was like, yeah, well, you know, he got hurt. Too bad for him. And she's like, no, we have to help him. What if one of our teammates got hurt? You think uh, fault line? Well, let me rephrase that. She said we have to help him. And her concern was if they didn't, that, you know, fault line might blame their group, basically. So she made a play to go get him. And I think it was definitely the right one, even knowing the risk of, of having lung there. Yeah, that's a tough call. You know, it's it's kind of that honor among thieves thing. Well, that's 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 vintage Taylor. Is that is that can I say that? Uh yeah, I mean that's that's a good way to put it. You know, she's gonna take that moral high ground and not want to leave uh even a temporary teammate bleeding on the floor, so to speak, or literally in this case. And so I I think bitch's pragmatic approach makes a lot more sense neuter's not part of their team the other people are even more ruthless than they are so they're probably not going to try to save tattletale or Gru or whoever if if everybody's under attack but skitter makes the choice to do that and uh and they follow along with it it's it's a coin flip if if they can save him then maybe he'll be able to be restored and jump back in the fight, but they're, they're kind of pushing all their chips in on trying to get him. Yeah. So Kaiser does using his ability to manifest metal. He assaults, assaults lung, not having the kind of success that he thought he was going to have make does get some pretty good hits on him, but, but lung survives. Then Sundancer comes in and, this power we can see why she had earlier said she didn't couldn't really engage without the threat of hurt hurting her teammates there um she could create a miniature sun that was incredible and definitely goes along like you said with her comment earlier where she's like i'm kind of the artillery (laughs) and so you want to make sure you're firing into enemy territory and not amongst your own folks And luckily they have a clear target uh, when she's there, but let me step back for a minute on Kaiser. Mm -hmm. The way he fought reminded me of what they used to tell my son when he was in karate as a kid. And that was, you got to use combos, you know, and and Kaiser is just seems like he keeps going for the haymaker. You know, he thinks that, Oh, this will be the one that'll take him down. I'll just stand back and admire my handiwork. Yeah. And it's like, no, you need to just pound him until he can't get up and just keep pounding because 
everybody knows the guy kind of regenerates or uh, gets stronger. And, and, so, and Skitter made that point to him. He's like, look, <laughs> he's going to get the, the longer you fight him, the more str- the stronger he's going to become. And if you haven't gotten him down by now, you're not going to. Yeah, I think his ego just totally took over and, you know, Billy Badass, you know, came out for a dance and 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 got smacked pretty hard. So I was I was I was happy for that, at least that <laughs> Kaiser got whacked. But <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good laugh. And, and so Sundancer creates her son. And it's so I mean. It's so hot that even at one point, uh, lung buckles, lung physically has sprouted wings. His neck is elongated. The guy's a dragon, essentially, at this point. But her, her, the power of her son is such that he buckles. Um, he ends up getting free. And then it's his pyrokinesis versus hers. And he is able to, you know, squash her sons as she tries to recreate them a second and third time. Yeah, Lung is just off the charts. I think if he was with a different group or had somebody like Coil with him, then th- that'd be that'd be it for everybody. You know, Ooh, I hadn't thought of that. They they would have the brains and the brawn and and just be totally unstoppable. But luckily, he doesn't, and he's not as egotistical as Kaiser. But he's he's got his own, you know, I'm I'm invincible streak, and so that gives them a, a tiny opening, but yeah, to be able to just absorb the power of a son is yeah. Kind of insane. And then he escaped from um, the, the metal cage that Kaiser had been constructed, goes over to, to Sundancer flames her. She's actually fireproof, but you know, that wouldn't have helped her had he gotten a hold of her. He ends up grabbing. I like how, how Skitter assaults, his or insults his ego standing there with her knife and her her baton out and and saying you know i'm challenging you physically please don't burn me please don't burn me she manages to get inside his head and that that worked out she ended up what did she end up doing having a a, a cockroach dab a um, a caterpillar a bit of caterpillar in some of neuter's blood uh, excuse me blood and then rub that in lung's eye and that drugged him up and that was it good night for lung yeah i like the way wild bow kind of had the tongue in cheek you know this always sounded such a good idea in oh, yeah. <laughs> shows but now that i'm the one saying it's really me that you want uh yeah it's kind of weak <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is not a good choice <laughs> but she had this trick up her sleeve and and it was uh pretty brilliant and and we don't find out uh you know it's clever writing by Wild but we have no idea what's going on until Lung drops her and then falls to the ground. So, you know, yeah, we're inside her head. That's our point of view, but we're not getting told everything that's going on. Yeah, and that's that's a classic thing by an author. Uh, in my youth, I was a huge Sherlock Holmes fan, and uh, you know, it always blew me away how he'd all observe all these things and everything, and then. I reread them as an adult and it was like, well, Arthur Conan Doyle didn't put any of that stuff in there for the reader to see. So uh-huh. of course it's going to seem like Sherlock Holmes is, you know, a mind reader or magical or something because we didn't know it was coming. Yeah. And so there is a little bit of that, which is, which is totally cool. You know, I'm fine with that, that method being used. Uh, it definitely keeps the suspense going and you're wondering like, well, why is this, why is his grip weakening or why is he not shaking her as hard? Yeah. And then it gets really grisly. I mean, I understand why, but like, dang, Skitter. That is yeah. so oh, blooded stuff, man. <laughs> oh, yes. The the uh, eye thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Tell me what your thoughts were about that. That was well, nasty. Well, he calls she calls Tattletale. And they're in the middle of something, but she finally gets her on the phone and says, Lunk and heal no matter what. Right. And you're like, hold on a minute. This is going. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And finally, Tattletail's like, yeah, you know, if he loses an arm, it'll come back in, you know, a few months or whatever. And so I'm like, okay, well, that would definitely slow him down. You know, if she could 
but I'm like, what is she going to cut it with? I mean, yeah, right. You know, he's like solid metal and, and the, the guy that was, you know, putting holes in him is, is down for the count too. So I don't think she's got like a sawzall lying around mm. or, you know, an hour to get through something. And then she goes for the eyes and was like, oh man, yeah, I guess. But seriously, that is. So this character, this, this teenage girl has gone from curling up in the fetal position on the top of a roof in their first battle, uh, afraid of getting flamed to gouging out this guy's eyes. Is, is that, is that character growth? Uh, it's character something. Um, I don't know if maybe she got a little neuter's blood and she's hallucinating a bit oh, or, or what, but she is, uh, I, I guess she knows she, she almost, as she said earlier, you know, rotted his private parts off with, with bug bites. He was in the bird cage and he got out. No, and no. So, PRT headquarters. Oh, PRT headquarters. You're right. I'm sorry. And so she's, you know, maybe thinking that there's, I got to do something pretty heavy here, or this is just going to keep coming back like bad chili. So, yeah. but still to be able to actually do it. I mean, the adrenaline's up. Yes. She was almost dying. Yes. Other people are almost dying, but still, man, I don't know. This was, this was quite a, a jump in violence level for her. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And she she thought about it for half a second, then went on and did it. She did have the presence of mind. As you said, Kaiser's down after after getting the getting pimp slapped pretty good. <laughs> uh, she she talks to Finya, one of the uh, his uh, his Valkyrie giants, as she's getting ready to leave with uh, Minya and Kaiser under her arms and says, basically, hey, you know, um, I'll leave it to you. But maybe you ought to tell Kaiser what happened. And maybe if he's you know, if he's got a sense of arm honor he'll let this whole dog fighting thing go considering that we were the ones that saved his bacon that was pretty slick and that's it almost seems like she's getting more of that kind of criminal mindset you know that i i gotta put the bag the the enemy down for the count on the one hand and then also i'll do some horse trading here i've got some leverage now i'm going to use it to try to, you know, get out of another situation, almost like extortion, if you will. Uh, not, not, not near that strong, but a little bit of uh, quid pro quo, at least. Yeah. At the very least. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's almost like she's, uh, she's treading on some thin ice here with the whole you know, amateur ophthalmologist and, uh, <laughs> oh, and, oh, and the horse goodness. trading going on. So yeah so so they part from from kaiser's crew and go on out to to see neuter and labyrinth and coils guys we did get a display of labyrinth's power where and she actually put down uh only lee or made it difficult for him to 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 fight on and she has the ability to to warp surroundings uh I haven't determined if it's actually inside people's heads or if she's physically doing this. Any thoughts on that? I think it's, I think it's just a hallucination because she does that thing where she touches Skitter's cheek and Skitter can see the world as it's supposed to be. And so I think only Lee got taken out because he believed the hallucination and then decided to materialize where he thought the ground was, but he was 20 feet in the air and he ended up crashing and then breaking something. And then, you know, they were able to, to uh, incapacitate him from there. But yeah, it's hard to say. It's, uh, it, I, it's to be determined. I, there's definitely some gray area there, I think. And how about the coil sniper, the one who fell off the, fell off the building, had the presence of mind to crawl over to a sniper rifle and put one into Oni, Oni Lee's uh, leg. Yeah, these these guys are are serious mercenaries. Uh, Coyle's got some great people, and you wonder if, as part of his power, he's able to, because there's been a couple other folks that have been able to kind of buff their 
lieutenants or through their powers, make people feel emotions, uh, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And you wonder if maybe part of Coyle's power is not necessarily inspiring fanatical loyalty, but buffing his, his troops in some way, you know, maybe they don't feel pain as much or they're able to focus better or I don't know. I don't know if there that's anything there or not, but they seem way better than just your normal mercs. So maybe they're, they're augmented in some way. Could be, could be. And so the, uh, the groups part ways, um, neuter and labyrinth head down into one of the sewer uh, manholes, Rachel and Taylor ride one of the dogs back toward the lair. They get there, they get to the beach dismount and they walk together and Taylor again tries to interact with her. Yeah, this is uh, this is Taylor kind of going back to the Taylor we know and love rather than uh, the scary lady with the knife. <laughs> and, you know, I totally get it. She's she feels pretty connected with the group, except for Rachel. Mm -hmm. And they've just been through a real critical time, uh, a very intense event. And, you know, at times Taylor had to kind of verbally slap Rachel upside the head and say, don't go do this now. Right. When they're trying to save neuter. And so I think she's hoping that uh, that's created a bond in some way and she can try to try to build on that. But do you think, do you think she'll be successful if you had to, if you had to venture a guess now at this moment? Well, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, after they get back to the lair, Taylor talks to, to uh, Lisa about it a little bit about whether Rachel has, you know, kind of a, a mental block against that doesn't allow her to pick up on nonverbal cues or, uh, and, and, you know, they talk about it and Lisa says, do not talk about this with Rachel that that would not go over well. And so I think, I think it'll get better. I think they'll, I think Rachel will maybe accept her as one of the pack, if you will, rather than uh, kind of a, a stray dog that's kind of tried to hang out with them and you don't know what they're going to do. But I don't think Rachel maybe has the ability to really bond with anyone. I think that's going to be hard, hard, hard nut to crack for anybody. Lisa goes into a little bit uh, detail here. Let's let me read this one part. As they're talking about her inability to, uh, to, to read cues, Lisa says, all the cues we give each other as part of regular conversation, she doesn't get them. She probably couldn't learn them with a year of concerted effort. It's not just that she doesn't get it. The most basic interactions are messed up by the canine psychology hardwired into her head. And I think she had mentioned that she had speculated that this has something to do with, with her trigger event. The, the, the thing that makes her so in tune, the thing that gives her her power and makes her so in tune with her dogs, also the counter side to that prevents her from interacting normally with people. And I thought that was a great explanation. We saw earlier in this chapter that Taylor was having trouble under severe emotional stress, being able to control her interaction with the bugs. and that they're almost kind of coming, they're being summoned without her knowing it, if you will. And so you can imagine with what Rachel has gone through that her being able to interact with the dogs would be that much more powerful and could displace her usual processing and, and connection with people. Yeah. And so that ends chapter 10 and we'll move on to interlude number five gregor the snail and we get a intimate look at gregor and fault lines crew um what were your thoughts of this this uh, interlude this was by far my favorite interlude oh i really enjoyed this had a, had a really different flavor to it than all the other ones the other ones seemed to be kind of oh i forget the the technical term but they were kind of prequels of what was going to happen 
whereas this one's giving you a little bit of background into what may have happened in the past and and again kind of building out the the worm universe mm, i see what you mean and so i really liked and you know this is a, a throwback but you know back in the day you and i spend a fair amount of time in clubs and uh <laughs> us nah. <laughs> Our, my curiosity always, you know, wondered what, what is back upstairs? What is the rooms looking like? And so his description yeah. of that, I thought was really cool. I never got to be in the VIP area or anything. So me either. <laughs> so that was kind of cool to hear that. And so I guess that resonated with me a little bit, but uh, yeah, I really like this interlude a lot. Neuter is an interesting, an interesting character. He's up there in the in the champagne room if you will <laughs> uh up there with girls and um selling yeah i don't know how to put this <laughs> selling hallucinogenics to them and all he's having to do basically is dip a, a finger or a, or he did he use his tail no his tongue in a, yep. in a tablespoon of water and it sent him on a psychedelic trip that was safe for all intents and purposes and non-addictive and uh you, he couldn't overdose people on it either yeah i i totally get where he's coming from i guess he's uh he's a 16 year old red-blooded male as far as we know i mean we know he's male we don't know if the blood is actually red i don't remember yeah, since when he's he got was orange bleeding. skin exactly <laughs> And all blue eyes with uh, square pupils, was it? Or rectangular? Something rectangular, something wild. Rectangular, yeah. So, yeah, we'll call him red-blooded. But, you know, we can all remember what it was like to be 16. And Sure. But he is so far out of the norm physically that this is like his one way of trying to interact with the opposite sex. And, and so, you know, I, I totally get where he's coming from with that. It is it's wild that that's all it takes and that it's, it has no side effects or whatever. And, you know, they, they're in the perfect location, right? He's like you said, he's in the champagne room. They have a bouncer that'll send people upstairs. So he's got a uh, target rich environment as we used to call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as Gregor is Gregor is going through the, the, the club, um, he, interacts with neuter and uh, spitfire and labyrinth labyrinth her powers she may be another case where the her powers have made her mind such that she can't interact normally with people yeah and that's an interesting twist i think where you you've seen it in the movies where the people with powers might be emotionally skewed by what's happened to them but i don't know we've seen i don't remember seeing necessarily where people's minds were actually this disjointed or or this disrupted and so this is a really interesting case where she's fairly lucid when her powers are waning but when the powers are waxing then it's almost impossible for her to interact with folks yeah let's see here fault line uh, as as Gregor uh, comes into her office, Faultline is busy at her desk trying to figure out a way around the Manton effect. Yeah, it's it's kind of like, you know, when when we were kids reading comic books, you know, uh, well, what does Superman do when he's not at the he's not fighting crime or he's not at the Fortress of Solitude? You know, does he see if he can light a a matchstick? you know, with one eye closed or I mean, you know, what, what, what does he do with his time? And so here, here we have kind of an answer to that. And it's interesting, you know, there, there are at least rumors or, you know, we don't know how corroborated the evidence is on people being able to get around things or, or do different things. But uh, there's this other parahuman narwhal who apparently has gotten around the Manton effect. And so, uh, fault lines just experimenting and trying to figure out if that's possible and then gregor decides it's a good time to try to kind of scare the hiccups out of her so to speak <laughs> so. yes he he it turns out he's, he's trying to do her a favor he he chokes her out trying to get her to have a second trigger event and i think this is the first time that this concept has been mentioned the idea that some parahumans actually can have a second trigger yeah, we haven't 
haven't heard that before. We've kind of heard the opposite where some folks have super mild trigger offense, uh, you know, especially second generation folks. But the idea that somebody could have uh, more than one and it would cause other things to happen, that's the first time this has come up. When she brought Neuter and Gregor onto the team, um, they asked her to do some investigating for them. Um, they turns out they're more unique than is realized. They have these two, they each have a, a unique tattoo somewhere on them. And they're part of a group of capes that have been turning up across North America over the past several years. And what those two have done is kicked back part of their earnings back to, to fault line and asked her to do an investigation on capes such as themselves. And um, fault line brings out what, what little bit of information she has to has to have this discussion with, with Gregor. And she says this, you and neuter, you already know, aren't alone. On a steady basis, parahumans have been turning up across North America. Retrograde amnesia, all marked by the same tattoo as you on various parts of their body. Each dumped in an out-of-the-way location in an urban area. Alley, ditches, rooftops, or under, under buildings. So these capes have been, these abnormal-looking capes have been showing up across the country for several years. And one of the things that Fault Lines discuss, discusses is that the physical disfigurements have seemed to been declining as more of these people who have this tattoo show up. They to finally where they actually, they have one girl who showed up who was completely normal looking physically. This was reminiscent of me uh, for me of the kind of the X-Men stuff and the mutants where you had folks that were, you know, could move things with their minds or had med magnetic power. And then you had people that just, you know, look different and, and were shunned basically. And so they, they point out that there may be more kind of the quote unquote monstrous parahumans humans out there than, than they know about, but you know, they've, they name off a few of them, one that looks like a beetle, uh, as well as Gregor and Neuter. And yeah, it seems like that there are a steady stream of folks that are kind of uh, either going through the trigger events or appearing in some way. And, but they, yeah, the last one that they find, and they, they're looking at this still shot of uh, the girl changing and she's got this same tattoo and she looks perfectly normal. So then it comes out that there's this, this possible person called the dealer. Right. And speculating on, is someone actually selling powers? Is this, is this smoke and mirrors or is this a thing? Um, it seemed unlikely uh, that this would be happening, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, the universe or the spectrum of powers seems to span just about everything. And so it wouldn't be that hard to imagine that there'd be somebody who was like a, a tinker, but with, you know, genetic knowledge or heightened knowledge of chemistry. Well, I guess Bakuda sort of fills that out with her being able to make explosives. And so, well, panacea oh, can alter biology. Right. Good point. Yeah. And so if there's, there could very well be somebody out there who's able to detect what changes occur in people that have the, the strong potential to be parahumans. And if they got together with the right person who could kind of reverse engineer that, then yeah, it, it, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like it could be possible. All right. So yeah. Fault lines and gives Gregor the, the results and uh, lets him know we're going on to another another phase of the investigation. More more to come on that. And that takes us to the the end of the interlude. Um, arc five, buddy. What, uh, what's your overall impressions of this arc? I like this one a lot. It was definitely intense. Even the the kind of calm scenes had lots of intense emotion in them. 
so it was it was pretty much uh, pedal to the metal the whole time. There wasn't really any kind of oh let's sit around and drink our hot chocolate scenes, but but I, I really enjoyed it a lot. It seems like if the other two groups had as much success as Skitter's group, then ABB might be finally put back in the cage, so to speak, and uh, maybe even be disabled permanently. So, and then the uh, the chess moves continue after that. The ones that that Tattletail observed from when she pointed out that people were already trying to figure out how to turn things to their advantages. So once, once ABB is out of the way for good, then, then now that fun begins. Sure. Then you got that vacuum and people are going to, going to fill those voids. So that's, that's probably where this is going next. I'm guessing. All right. And now it's time for Andy to announce his choice for key character of the arc, whether hero or villain caper civilian, Andy will identify the character that stood out to him, whether it's for good or ill. Andy, who's your selection this episode and why? I'm going to go with Coil. I think it's intriguing the way he kind of orchestrated these alliances. It's it's mysterious. We don't know what his powers are, but... You know, he got the alliances together. They they were successful as far as we know, at least in Skinner's case, for sure, they were successful. And then he's got these uh, soldiers that are, are working for him who definitely seem to have more skills, more skills than than a normal human would have. Yeah, they uh, you know, we didn't touch on it, but uh, the you had the one guy that that shot only Lee that we mentioned, but then his partner you know, just kind of throws him over his shoulder and, and, you know, shifts his weapons around and then just walks off with him. Doesn't need a ride. Everything's good. It's like, what? Uh, and, and they don't describe them as being like, you know, six foot tall Schwarzenegger guys. They just seem like they're just guys with, with good weapons. So I think you, you wonder if there's kind of wheels with in wheels here, you know, maybe coils thinking, well, I'll be an alliance to get, ABB out of the way and then I'll get everybody else to kind of fight against each other and then I'll take over with my you know my super soldier army so wow so he's he's my choice for uh for key character of the arc all right that sounds good and with that folks I think we'll be signing off we once again want to say thank you for joining us in this episode and remind you folks, we really appreciate it if you would consider uh, sharing our, our podcast with uh, your friends who you might have got to invest in Worm. We, we want to get this story out and as popular as possible. It really is such a good read. And like I said, we hope you'll return and join us on our next episode. And with that, I'll say take care. Thanks from me as well. And Keith, as always, it's a pleasure uh, really enjoying this. I think you're being a great Sherpa for the story and uh, can't wait till the next episode. We'll see y'all later. Thanks for joining us in this video. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more information in the link down below. Catch you later.